everybody and welcome to uh, a very fun day in that I am ready for Xana to hear my story but a very sad day because it's Xandy's last day on and that's why we drink so sad I didn't get the permanent position I'm a little <laughs> disappointed but I understand no but I'm I'm just that's grateful. mainly your sister's call I think yeah <laughs> true, true. Let everyone everyone blame her for that um, yeah, but let's just no. make a burner. We all hate Christine account and let's bring Zandy on. Oh, no. Just see what happens on the let's internet. See what <laughs> I don't think I'm coming out of that uh, positively, but no, I'm very grateful. It's been lots of fun. So I'm like, really, it's been so nice to to be able to do this. So thank you. Um. So the by the time by the time we've finished recording these, I actually haven't seen any feedback yet on how people. <laughs> took your uh your entrance and your exit on mm -hmm. and that's why we drink but i can say in the last several live live streams instagram live streams i've done people have been asking what's going to happen with christine being gone so many people have said can zandy come on the show Aww. so i'm i'm assuming that the last four weeks or i guess with christine uh, weaseled, weaseled her way in in the middle for the Christmas episode. I think people were super stoked to have you. So I really do appreciate you coming on. It's been a lot of fun. And I guess for the last time, Zandy, why do you drink? Oh my gosh. Why do I drink? Um, because why do I drink? I didn't prepare. I, I mean, didn't say, welcome. oh man, lots of reasons, lots you of reasons. No, right things in. are pretty good. Things are pretty good. I'm like now also thinking, I don't know what, I feel like life is going to change so much in the next two months, potentially. Not really, but I Your don't know. fame is just going to soar. <laughs> That's it's what it is. Out of control. <laughs> I'm drinking some very expensive alcohol right now because I can afford it after <laughs> this boost in my fame. I'm sitting back, relaxing. You're locking the doors because there's just handprints slamming into the windows <laughs> trying to get to you. <laughs> Um, no, I guess I'm drinking because, yeah, maybe because this is my last one. This is, this is sad, but it's, it's been amazing. And, um, yeah, and I have been thinking about that lack of feedback because I'm like, oh, God, the first one comes out and if someone's like gives a fe gives feedback and then I'm like, well, shit, I didn't do that for the next three. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm like thinking out loud. Like, it's just like, I've been, uh, it's, I, that's how I wonder with most logistics of people being ahead because i know mm -hmm. a lot of people a lot of podcasts try to like backlog their episodes i don't know if any of us are ever successful at that but uh i do wonder like oh what if you like try to really spice things up and you find out three months later it was not a good idea yeah so we'll find that's... out together sandy <laughs> okay didn't good go well <laughs> i'll be hiding out in your castle with a moat or something where you're just hiding from fans <laughs> at all times you know um, what hey as long as i can afford it then i can't complain doing pretty well but no, um, what are you, why do you drink though? You know, what's funny is I ask and I always, I'm always surprised that someone asks back. Um, cause I don't, I also didn't prepare. I, <laughs> today I drink. So I really have gotten into Pokemon card collecting. Um, mm -hmm. by the time this comes out, I just have no idea where my finances will be at this point. I was going to say you're poor because <laughs> I think I'll literally be like desperately, uh, oh, no. rooming in your, in your castle. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. So I, I was doing it as like kind of a little bit of a hobby for a while, but it was like a, like a playful with, with my ADHD, I'm hyper fixated on a different thing every week. So when I got into Pokemon cards, I was like, oh, this won't last. Like, I'll just get a, a couple cards and call it a day. And it hasn't stopped. And so now I'm getting nervous because now I've gotten all the mm. small cards and all that's left are, like, expensive cards. <laughs> um, so I... I drink in a good way and a bad way because I can never complete anything. I, I never hold attention for this long. So this is like kind of a win, but at such a grave, like, <laughs> oh no, in such a scary way where I'm like, okay, like at any moment, you know, hyperfixation, you can die down now. It's time to stop, pump the brakes. And uh, I feel like I'm about to start putting like big money onto cards, which I don't know what uh, literally blaze. Well, I've talked to blaze in the past and we've talked about, uh, Pokemon cards. And at the time I was saying like, Oh yeah, like I don't spend that much money. And now I'm getting nervous that I'll have to backtrack if he asks, asks about it again. So. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm getting nervous. That's why I drink. 
That's fair. I mean, as someone, who, but like, at least what I think about that, spending money on those things, like I used to play Magic the Gathering a bit, so I have a bunch of Magic the Gathering cards, um, but I got so much enjoyment out of it, and I don't know how it's much so money fun. I've sunk into it. And like my record collection, I've thought about, I, I, li- oh. I calculated how much I've spent on records. It's un- like, just looking at the number, I was almost disgusted with myself. <laughs> But then I thought, you know, this is something that's that I enjoy. It's something that's important to me. Um, and it makes me happy. And also, if I spend too much, then I can sell them. So, right, <laughs> it's like, right. you know, there's still, it's not like necessarily a, like 100% sunk cost, but uh, especially because I enjoy them so much. So, I don't know. That's how I look at those things. I appreciate you saying, I've never really... I've, I literally, my thing is I collect a bunch of crap, but I just never finish any collection. So this one mm-hmm. just, I'm shocked at how far we've come and I didn't think we'd get here. And uh, the, I think the difference though, between your record collection and my Pokemon card collection is people are interested in your record collection. Aww. Meanwhile, like poor Allison, like I know that woman could <laughs> not, literally if I never said the word Pokemon again in front of her, she would just probably, you know, never bat an eye. Um, but she is forced because she's the only person around. I just show her my folder every day and I'm like, look at what I have now. And she's like, I so don't care. So oh my God. it really That's is a, like yeah. such a personal pride because I'm very aware that nobody else cares. So, uh, yeah. but I, I am very happy about it. So it, again, I drink cause it's a good thing and a, and a weird thing at the same time. Do you have a favorite card? That you've opened so far, Sandy. That's very. That's very kind of you to ask. Um, <laughs> well, I literally, I'm sincerely curious. I literally haven't thought about that because I was prepared for nobody to ever ask a single no. question about Pokemon. Um, I have a favorite Pokemon character from like childhood, but now that I'm collecting cards, I think my favorite card is different um, than the actual characters. Um, Oh, wow. Okay. Who's your so favorite childhood character? We can start there. It goes back and forth, but there's one named Scyther, and he was like the I green metal Scyther. guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. I thought he mm-hmm. was super duper cool. Oh, yeah. As I'm getting older, I really like Aerodactyl, who's he's basically yeah. just a dinosaur. But uh, um, Scyther is the one you caught in the um the uh like the jungle zone or whatever that thing you pay yeah. money the right? That's where you got Scyther. I remember that being a big thing that I wanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. I uh I I, I very much like him. I like to think he looks like the Green Goblin in real life, but with not, but like if like Edward yeah. Scissorhands and the Green Whoa, Goblin with a baby, yes. it would be Scyther. So uh, that's my favorite. But for as for cards, right now I've been trying to collect. I'm at the, by the time this comes out, I'm only like twenty cards left, and I'll be done with a deck, which has taken me almost an entire year. And um, unless I like had a midnight splurge and now I owe all of my money because I <laughs> have all the cards, but uh, I don't, it's not a favorite card, but it's a favorite lore. So there's in this one deck, there are these 15 cards that apparently never actually got sent out to the public. They were actually given as like Christmas gifts to the actual employees of the company that makes the cards. And so now people try to collect all 15 of these cards that were only handed out to employees. So the only way you'd have them is if they got trickled down and like passed on from an actual employee themselves. Wow. And so it's kind of almost like, do they exist or don't they? And I think only a handful of people have ever been able to collect all 15 of them. And I saw only once the entire collection has been available on eBay and it was for like it started at like 20 grand or something. So I'm never yeah. going to have that. I've like already written myself out of that mm-hmm. even being a possibility, but I like the lore behind it of like, Oh, is it real or isn't it? Heck yeah. That's so cool. Oh yeah. yeah. I love that. And there's some drama. Some of the designs are like, Oh, well this, the, the artist didn't get the, pr- they didn't get approval to change it. And like, so there's like different versions of cards where like some of it was approved by the artist and some of it is like a little mm. like ding to the artist's uh, IP. Anyway, it becomes a whole thing, but I kind of, and I think I fell for the drama of it and I've just stayed ever since. I love it. Oh now, my gosh, now that cool. we've lost every single person because <laughs> I'm talking about Pokemon cards. I have a story for you and it's about your hyperfixation. I don't know if you call it a hyperfixation, but at least your love and your passion. Oh, which, Schaefer. What is it? Today I have a lighthouse story for you. Oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. Um 
I was hoping this would happen. I, hey. I, I guess what? I also have a lighthouse story. <laughs> <gasps> Zandy! No, yes. you don't. Is oh it the same? God. It can't be the same There's, story. No, I, and I actually, it's funny, my notes at the top, I like, was gonna, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about how I picked a lighthouse story that, what from what I could tell, had zero paranormal Ghosts. yeah okay. connection okay. um and i even had a couple written down uh because zach baggins i know went to a couple uh he went to um execution rocks which i got to see uh Fun. and then um point sir lighthouse in california um oh, and yeah but i, I don't not know aware of how many uh lighthouses he had been to <laughs> two <laughs> he i know there's like the main haunted one is the saint augustine lighthouse mm -hmm. that's i i'm pretty sure i've covered it already though so i was frantically looking for a different lighthouse to cover and um i honestly i was scared because i was I was like, I have to do a, like, there's no way I'm not going to do a lighthouse story. So then I found, it was like this niche topic where I was like, oh man, like, am I even going to find one? I feel like there's only one haunted lighthouse in the world and I already used the story. And now I feel a little bit like how I imagine you and Christine are with Beach to Sandy, where like you trap yourself into like such a niche thing that like you just hope that you find information on it. Is, is that how it works with Beach to Sandy? Well, actually, weirdly with Beach to Sandy, I feel like we're better off if we can trap ourselves like there's oh. so many different so like an example is we we tried to do uh reviews of um dispensaries or something and it was so hard to find reviews because there were so many and they were all just like all these people talking about like yeah i'm really good i know weed really well blah 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 here are some technical things as to why the strains that they have are not oh. good and i'm reading this like i am bored to tears i don't know what the <laughs> heck they're saying this is not funny so we actually we still haven't done one people keep requesting it but we're like we need to find a, a way to like make it more specific so our research isn't so difficult um so yeah i don't know like it, we've sometimes when we keep it general we feel like like we do reviews of airports and we're just like it's it's a lot because you're like there's so many reviews of airports that you're like oh, we need to which is wild because as as someone who's not part of that world why on earth would I ever think of a review for an airport and the fact that you know that there's so many and we are so many on very different pages on airport reviews <laughs> uh, well okay well then this is not how I thought things are for you but I would always be afraid that if we picked something so specific on Beach mm -hmm. to Sandy there would just be nothing at all so I was afraid of that with haunted lighthouses I thought those too specific but. Um, I, within like five minutes, I like hit a home run. I am so shocked that I've never heard of this. I love when this happens because after five years, I'm always like, oh, I've, I've heard it and I can't cover it or I've heard it and I've already done it. I love when I find something by accident that is this juicy. Oh my so gosh. I'm so excited. I really hope if you ever go to a lighthouse and I'm invited to just one, I would really like uh -huh. to be invited this to one. this one. Okay. I, um, I think I've been to like 15 this year. Oh, that actually would be my, one of my uh, resolutions is to see more lighthouses than the year before. So I think we I literally talked about doing resolutions last year or last week on. Yeah. The... I just remembered that. <laughs> okay. Well, happy belated to everybody. <laughs> happy belated new year. This is Zandy's resolution, by the yeah, way. See more late. lighthouses. <laughs> <laughs> Minus to, like, have money after my Pokemon card collection. <laughs> okay, good. So maybe one day we can combine forces and I'll show you my Pokemon cards in a lighthouse. <gasps> and I'll just absolutely oh, lose my mind. The world would explode. I love it. Anyway, Zandy, this is the story. Tell me if you know this lighthouse. If you have fun facts, uh -huh. I would love you to chime in. This is Point Lookout Lighthouse. Where is that? It is uh -huh. in Maryland. Oh, Point Lookout in Maryland. I was seeing... I looked at lighthouses um in maryland but i don't think i saw that one um point never heard of it never heard of it on my end okay i just i'm looking at a picture i'm not gonna spoil anything it looks fucking creepy um right. it's it looks, gorgeous i love the yeah. house style but like yeah it looks creepy as hell so yeah. apparently that house style the designer who made i tried to throw in fun facts about the lighthouse for you because i know like i didn't want it to just be like the history. I tried to find like fun facts on mm -hmm. lighthouses to, to keep you mentally stimulated. <laughs> um, and apparently the house look, you probably know more about this than I do, but it was, this lighthouse was inspired by another lighthouse nearby called Ledge Lighthouse, which has the same house look. 
Okay. Fun fact. So I don't cool. know if that's like if there's different categories of lighthouse styles, but I you're right. This does immediately fall into the house looking one. Mm -hmm, Looks like mm -hmm. a little home with a lighthouse stuck in it or something. My, my experience is mostly just what I've seen, and like I call it like, oh yeah, it looks like a house. Um, and I've seen, you know, obviously the more <laughs> traditional ones, like that are tall towers. Um, but I'm, I like, I'm no expert. I, I would love to become an expert. So I'm like, actually, this is something that's fairly new to me. But um, I think you did it right though, because I'm, I'm not my the notes. My research really did say like the house style. Oh, so cute. okay, cool. I'm. I think you're on something. I should have just not said that and been like, yeah, I'm an expert. I know what I'm talking about. Right, right. So this is apparently one of it's fighting for uh, its life in terms of mm. will it or won't it be number one for the most haunted lighthouse in the United States. I guess it is always like kind of hitting number one and then something beats it out and it keeps climbing the tier. But it's one of the most haunted at the very least um, lighthouses in the country. It looks as it did in 1927, which it's a restoration though. So it's a decommissioned lighthouse and it, in the past has been restored to look as it did in 1927. The only difference from 1927 to now is that it is closer, further away from the water because mm -hmm. the original one was, it had eroded due to like weather over time or something. So yeah. I think they, they must have moved it a little bit, but that's the only difference between then and now. It has been featured on the TV shows Weird Travels, Mystery Hunter, and unfortunately, this show already exists, Zandy, Haunted Lighthouses. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I should look into that. It was on TLC, apparently. Cool. I don't know if it, maybe the show itself is decommissioned, in which case Zandy Sheep <laughs> can pick it back up. But uh, a dream hosting job is anything lighthouse related. Like, right? literally. Literally. Well, I feel like I would have thought, like, oh, let's do a show about haunted lighthouses. But then I would have fallen into the same trap where I was like, what if there's only, like, five of them? And then I do five episodes and the show's over. So <laughs> uh, apparently there's enough for there to be a, a TLC show. So uh, the lighthouse is at Point Lookout State Park, which is in St. Mary's County, Maryland, which threw me off for a second because the actual city... It's in St. Mary's County, but it's in a city called Scotland, Maryland. Okay. And for a second, I it was too late, and I was like, is it Scotland or Maryland? Am I covering <laughs> two stories by accident at once? So the lighthouse is... <laughs> the, sorry to jump in. My, my, um, my story takes place in Scotland. Shut <laughs> up. This is really weird. I'm like... <laughs> um, are you sure it's not Maryland, dummy? <laughs> I'm literally looking at my notes now. I'm like, this was Scotland, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Was it Scotland? Um, it is Scotland, yes. Okay, um, well... I'm glad I could fix. I'm glad I could fix any like, worries I'm, while creating like, them at the same time. Because yeah, now I'm like, man, did I mess up? Like <laughs> hearing you talk about Scotland, Maryland, thinking it's Scotland. Like, oh shit, I did the same thing. Also, but because no. I've never heard of Scotland, Maryland, and I was like, this me has neither, to yeah. be just the world messing with me. So the lighthouse uh, is in Point Lookout State Park, and the lighthouse itself is where the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay meet. Nice. And I have. Um, if there were a body of water I have a personal attachment to, it would either be the Potomac River or Chesapeake Bay because I grew up uh, right around that area. So they're just words I've heard a million times. So I feel like I mm. have some sort of ownership to them. I think I saw a lighthouse on the Potomac. Did you? Um, yes, I saw a lighthouse. It was, um, I believe, George Washington Lighthouse or something like that. Uh, it was, oh, what was it? Um I don't know. Uh, Fort Washington Fort Washington Park or something? No, that's in New York. I don't know. I definitely saw a lighthouse on the Potomac. So that's why I'm like hearing this story. I'm like, how did I not see this? How am I this like... Is, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but is there a lighthouse? Uh, because as you were saying it, I was already... You said Washington and lighthouse, and in my mind I envisioned a little lighthouse with a big statue of George Washington on top. Do you know if there are any novelty lighthouses where there are like fun statues or something particularly visually pleasing about it compared to others? Um, kind of. So this is a novelty lighthouse that I actually recently saw. Um, friend, a group of D and a f group of friends of mine met in West Virginia at New River Gorge, and everyone knows my obsession with lighthouses. So we went to see this lighthouse called Summersville Lighthouse, hmm. and it, I was like, this is so weird because you go up to it and it's just this lighthouse 
and there isn't there's like a lake nearby and i'd heard like multiple like this like when you're talking about they've moved lighthouses before like okay. from the water in or either from the water or close to the water away but i was like this is so strange and the guy who's giving the tour is like, yep, this started as a joke. And I was like, what? Huh? Apparently, a local wind farm had some sort of accident and they had this, tur- and like a, one of the windmills um, had an issue. So they, it was, they decommissioned the windmill and they had this giant blade from the windmill and were like, what do we do with it? And some students at the local university, um, I don't know if it was University of West Virginia or which university, I totally forget, but they came up with these plans to create a lighthouse and like a student designed the staircase and oh my they, gosh, and it was made from this old windmill. Uh, They're upcycling. Yeah. And it was like, it was a whole, a whole local project, like a bunch of people uh, locally were a part of it. And uh, yeah, so it's like, I would say that's a novelty because it, Definitely doesn't have any real like use, <laughs> right. but it's a tourist. It's become a tourist destination, and it's a. Uh, it was a pretty cool story of like how the community was like, let's get behind this fun little project, and uh, so and it's sweet. it's big, and you can go all the way to the top, and it's gorgeous views. So that was lots of fun. I feel like if you're a lighthouse without a gorgeous view, like you're shunned by the other lighthouses. You're yeah. like the Rudolph <laughs> of of lighthouses. You know, <laughs> yeah, the fruit off of lighthouses. Um, but I did find that I I was kind of right. It was a Fort Washington lighthouse that was on the Potomac, uh, pretty close to D.C. that I saw. Oh. I, I've seen four uh, lighthouses within Maryland, but not this one. So this is reason to go back. Tricky, tricky. Now you've got to add one to your list. Well, here we go. Are you ready? There's some fun I'm facts so first. So ready. So it, like I said, it was decommissioned. It is. As of this one source I read, I don't know if this is now in past tense or what, but apparently at one point it was under renovation to become a museum. So it might now be a museum. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And it has appeared in the video game Fallout 3. Oh, so if I've any of those. That. Fun. Uh-oh, someone has been to the little lighthouse. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> uh, so originally the land was fishing and hunting territory for the Yakomiko tribe. And I hope I said that right. And then in 1500, Spanish explorers showed up. In 1612, our favorite straight white man, John Smith, shows up. And uh, only 20 years later, King Charles I gives the land to uh, a fellow named George Claver, a.k.a. Lord Baltimore, mm. which I am assuming is what Baltimore is. <laughs> Otherwise, weird coincidence. Yeah, so strange. <laughs> Apparently, George Claver, uh, maybe it's George Clavert. I'm not too sure, but I'm hoping. I think it. It sounds fancy that way. George Claver or Lord Baltimore, his son would go on to be the very first governor of Maryland. Fun fact. Um, when he grew up to be the governor, he built his manor on this property. Fun fact. So it has been it's got a lot of history to it. Fast forward. This was the 1630s. I'm sure a lot of history and trauma and disaster has happened on this property at some point, causing several ghosts. But we're going to fly past all of it and go straight to the 1800s. And that's including the deaths of probably natives and settlers at different points, as well as sailors during shipwrecks. And now we're at the War of 1812. So Point Lookout was used as a post for watching out for incoming British ships. And then into the 1820s, it's decided that in that time since the War of 1812, it has just been too dangerous of an area because there's minimal light for sailors, They have been seeing just shipwreck after shipwreck uh, and a lighthouse is needed. So uh, the at the time, Point Lookout is owned by the Taylor family and the government pays them, I think, around twelve hundred dollars for the land. So now the government now owns the land and they build a lighthouse there. They give the project to John Donahue uh, in, in 1830. And he's also built a bunch of other lighthouses nearby. I don't know if this one means anything to you, but the Blackstone, not Blackstone, Blackstone with an I in the middle, Blackstone, Mm. uh, Blackstone Island Lighthouse. He also made that one. And I guess they were like, holy crap, that's the best lighthouse I've ever (laughs) seen. You got to do this one. 
So uh, that was in 1830. So this that's when the lighthouse is officially, the original bones are put up. It is the, it's called the Point Lookout Lighthouse and it's built at one and a half stories with its torch. I guess that's the appropriate term for the light of the lighthouse torch. It was centered on the top. The entire house itself was made of wood and stone and it was officially in business late September of 1830. So the very first lighthouse keeper, because I take you through a whole timeline of <laughs> people living here. The first lighthouse keeper, his name was James Davis. And mysteriously, within months of him working at this lighthouse, drops dead. Oh, dear. Different sources say it was his wife or his daughter. I'm leaning more towards that it was his wife. Uh, Anne took over, was just like, well, I watched you do this for a couple months, so I'll just keep it up. And she got paid the same salary and everything. They were just like, hey, Anne's got it covered, <laughs> so let's just give it to Anne. Um, she also later dies in the lighthouse. And I didn't see a reason why. It was just in the middle of her doing her lighthouse keeper duties. They just found her in one of the rooms. Um, later, I don't know if this was like the person to, to take over after Anne, but his name was William Wood. And apparently he was very clumsy to a point where like whoever is in charge of the lighthouse and was giving him his paycheck they were like, William Wood, you are so bad at this that we are going to hold your paycheck for a year. Like, just oh. to see if you can even get through a day. Like, just, Oh, my God. Apparently, he, like, dropped a local cat and, like, a in a barrel of... Like, this was by accident. It's not... It sounds really abusive, but he would just was just so clumsy. Knocked things over all the time. I guess all he dropped a cat and, like, the lantern oil, and then it got contaminated. So they had to go, like, spend all this money to get new lantern oil out there. The, um, he kept breaking all the windows. I think he literally broke the light of the lighthouse oh at some God. point. It just sounds like he was like not meant for this job. Uh, eventually this is in 1853. Now a new guy's working there named Richard Edwards, who, if this source is telling me the truth, uh, he also died very quickly after working there. And then his daughter, Martha took over. And then she didn't die. She just married off and she was like, this is not the life for me. So she hands the post over to her sister, Pamela, which I love that it, we're keeping it in the family and no one cares. We're just like, hey, whoever wants the job, take it. Yeah, I was reading something um, when I was researching my thing that uh, a lot of these lighthouses, I mean, the uh, keepers, it'll go stay within the family and then uh, they'll, but they'll be married to like, the other keeper's family. So like in the one yeah. I read, there are a couple, two, uh, there's a principal keeper and then a, a, like a, an assistant or something. And those families would like marry each other. <laughs> and That's then so sweet. What like then we... more keepers would come in, like marry each other. And it was like all this like weird, like family thing that would be passed down and down and down and down. Or they'd marry like local people in like the, either it's like the, the Navy and the, 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 the fishermen, whatever, like, Everything. So, um, yeah, there's like a very, seems very family oriented lighthouse I've, keeping. I've immediately taken it wildly out of proportion. But in my mind, if I were married to like, let's say a sailor and I ran the lighthouse, I'd like to think I'd like change the bulb of the lighthouse to like their favorite color when they were coming in to shore. <laughs> like we'd have like a little thing where I'd be like, no Aww. one else knows what this means. Also, this sounds like. A real good setup, speaking of TLC or just television and in general, this sounds like a Kardashian situation. Like, it sounds like a really good reality show of families yeah. coming together and taking over a lighthouse. And this one has a history of lighthouses over here, and this one's got one another. It could turn yeah. into a, such a thing. Hallmark, are you listening? Just... <laughs> and there's that one clumsy guy who keeps dropping cats and <laughs> into terrible things. I, he was he's like the black sheep of the family like yeah. he's just trying to make his dad proud but you know <laughs> he just can't do it uh anyway i could see a lot of potential for that and also now that you now that i'm thinking about that really clumsy guy it's interesting that it seems like a lot of people are dying in this lighthouse and maybe he was just holding on for dear fucking life maybe mm. the lighthouse was trying to kill him and he was like not me and it just looks like he was the clumsy one but he was just like actually the one that Got away from the curse, yeah, you know? Yeah, sur surviving, yeah. He was at least white-knuckling his way through that job. <laughs> so anyway, it was in 1853, Richard 
work there, then his daughter Martha, and then later his daughter Pamela took over. So Pamela was the lighthouse keeper when the Civil War begins. So the uh, government actually, I guess when the Civil War began, they used Point Lookout's land for a Union hospital. I guess it was close enough to the battlefields bef that the soldiers could get there pretty quickly, but far enough away that it wasn't going to get damaged in the war. And what's interesting to me is apparently at this time, poor Pamela, she has really seen a transformation of this lighthouse in this whole area because right before it was a civil war, uh, I don't know, battlefield or involved in, in war at all, it was, the area was slowly becoming a like summer resort. And so there was a bunch of like beach cottages around and I guess there was more like water-based attractions and things like that. And she slowly watched it all close during the war. But since there were already all of these resorts in the area, or at least one really well-known one, uh, the government was like, hey, let's use that structure and that's going to be the hospital. So it wasn't actually the lighthouse itself that became the hospital, but it was still on the same property. So on the property was the resort that has now become a hospital. And on top of that, not only did it become a hospital, it became the... Hammond General Hospital, and it opened 1862. It was leased by the government. It also became a holding ground for Confederate prisoners of war. Mm. And so I guess they were like, we should probably keep them separate from the people in the hospital, uh, especially because I think it was a Union hospital. So keeping Confederate prisoners of war there, it just, they felt a divide was needed, uh, according to them. And so they decided that they were just going to expand the property. So they took this resort building. And we're like, we're just going to keep this a hospital. We're going to move the prisoners of war to a different part of the property, which then became Camp Hoffman. It was a, just a prisoner of war camp. It was, I, I'm pretty sure, the Union's largest Confederate prisoner of war camp. And uh, in total, 52, over 52,000 prisoners of war stayed on this property in the prisoner of war camp. Holy shit, that's a lot. And not only that, but it was 52,000 people they did not like, so they didn't mm -hmm. really treat them very well. The wide range of guesses is that somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 of the 52 uh, POWs died on this camp. Jeez. Um, most people have confined it to 4,000, so around 4,000 people had died. It was called Camp Hoffman again. It was on the same property. You could see the, ho the, ho the hospital slash resort you could see the lighthouse it was just on its own space and it was surrounded by three different forts that they made to i guess secure the prison one of those forts is called fort lincoln and it still stands oh wow so about guesstimating four thousand uh prisoners of war died from overcrowding from contamination of the food in the water apparently the water uh had a lot of bacteria in it the food was spoiled they were starving because they didn't want to eat the food because it was spoiled due to inclement weather. They were either dying of literally freezing to death or overheating. And then, of course, there was disease uh, just riddled everywhere at the time, mainly smallpox. There was also malaria and typhoid fever, but I think most of the death, disease-related deaths there were smallpox. And I saw a quote on one source that said, for every soldier that died in battle, two died of disease. So... Jeez. It was just, oh, it was infested and people were just dropping uh, the second they got there. So uh, the 1860s, during the mid-Civil mid -Civil War, at the same time, there's still other shipwrecks happening. Even though there's a lighthouse now, I, it's just, I think it just goes with the job that sometimes it's a, a rocky business. And uh, especially during war, I think it was... The area was probably manned and they were shooting down ships or whatever it was. But there was one warship coming into the area called the USS Tulip. And I don't know what happened, but this particular ship literally exploded and killed 50 people on board. And all those bodies started washing up to the shore. Oh, my God. Just... So much death everywhere on this one piece of property. It's really, and this, remember, this is natives all the way back in the 1600s were dying yeah. here. Settlers were dying here. Um, previous sailors. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. So during all of this, sweet 
Pamela Edwards, the lighthouse keeper, is still working there. Um, and so she could actually hear prisoners of war being tortured at Camp Hoffman. She also said that at one point, I don't know if she said this, but I guess at one point the female prisoners of war were kept separate and they weren't allowed at Camp Hoffman. And so they ended up like using the lighthouse itself as a place to, as a holding cell for the female prisoners. They also used it to interrogate prisoners of war. Um, apparently there was some torture that was actually allegedly done in the lighthouse itself. And since she worked there, she remembers seeing people getting tortured, Jeez. which made her a rebel sympathizer because they were all Confederate prisoners. And she helped people escape from the lighthouse. After the war, she ended up being fired. I ha wonder if it had something to do with that, or I don't know what the reasoning was, but they said, Pamela, it's time to go. And then from the 1870s all the way to 1908, a different uh, lighthouse keeper named William Yeatman took over, and he also allegedly died on site. So that's a lot of people just working the lighthouse and dying, let alone all the actual, like, yeah. more expected death. So while Will Yeatman was working there, because it was the 1870s into 1908, 1870s, 10 years after, maybe 15 years after the Civil War, the place was starting to become more of a vacation spot again. And even though they were trying to make all the buildings resorts and all that again, one of their main vacation hotels called the Fenwick Inn burned to the ground. Um, I don't know if anyone died during that, but it just seems like the place just kind of had a bout of bad luck after all of the negative energy happening over there. In the same year, there was a hurricane called the Gale of 78, and it ripped the deck of one ship off that was coming in, and it killed, depending on the source, 16 to 22 sailors that also started all washing up to shore. Jeez. One of the sailors that died in this wreck, his name was Jay Heaney. It was either James or Joseph, and I, I don't know which one it actually was, so I'm just calling him Jay Heaney. He either died in the actual wreck and his body was one of the ones washed up to shore after the hurricane, or he was one of the ones that survived and tried knocking on doors in the area to get help. And he ended up dying later from injuries. I don't totally know what the actual story was, but his ghost is now regularly seen right before storms hit. Mm. So in 1883 and in 1930, there were two different renovations that happened at this lighthouse. Um, both, doing improvements to make this lighthouse two apartments. It was getting split into two different apartments. So the idea was that two lighthouse keepers could live there at the same time and share the workload, which I think is kind of cool. Even though when you look at the lighthouse, I don't know if it looks, it looks smaller to me than an average lighthouse, at least the part where someone would live in. And so it's weird that they were now splitting it into two spaces. I feel like people were probably feeling cramped there, but. And I feel like usually there'd be a separate property, you know, uh, to live yeah. in. I, I don't know much, but I from the lighthouses I've seen, it's like, oh, here's the lighthouse. And over here is where uh, uh, people actually live. Um, and that's true for the one that I'm reading today. It's um, So, yeah, to have it all in one place, maybe it's more convenient that way. But yeah, yeah, it seems like a little bit of a, it seems like a lot. And I don't know if they, it seems like they were living there all the way up until this point too. I, I wondered for a second if it was that now they were having people move in and live there together, but it seems like people have been living there this whole time as the keepers. Mm -hmm. So um, now it's split into two apartments and I guess, I don't know which renovation it was, the 1883 or the 1930, but they also put in like a plumbing system, which is nice, like hot and cold <laughs> water. Uh, they had a, uh, a new bell and automatic alarm systems, because I guess before that point, without knowing anything about lighthouse mechanisms to ring the bell was a manual effort. And so mm. to ring the bell that became part of their like consistent, regular tasks where it was really exhausting. They would, it would be a, a time killer that they would have to, they'd be away from all their other duties. And so uh, also if, the light was out, I guess they wouldn't have known originally unless they like were doing a walk around. Anyway, now there's an alarm system that tells you when the light is out and the bells are ringing on its own. So it's just new and improved. Now in the 1960s, the last lighthouse keeper lived there named Raymond Hartzell. 
Uh, it was 1966, and he was there all the way until the last time the lighthouse was lit, which I imagine was very emotional. Uh, as someone who has dedicated his life to this mm -hmm. job, I I'm emotional, and I don't even really care about lighthouses. <laughs> so I imagine he was having a hard day when when the uh, lighthouse turned off for the last time. Uh, and Marilyn turned the Point Lookout property into a park and kept the lighthouse open as apartments. So there was two oh. different apartments there anyway. I guess they were like, let's just make it a thing. I want to live there. I, listen, <laughs> it is not apartments anymore. It ended in 1981. Oh, okay. So okay. from 1966 to 1981, it, people were living there. And at some point it said the Coast Guard took over and they were, I think they might have stationed, built their own little station next to the lighthouse at one point. I also heard the Navy owned the property for a second or they leased it from the state. I don't really know. I, I couldn't keep up with that timeline, but just know that the state of Maryland ended up taking it in, turning it into a park. And until the 80s, it was apartments. So people literally lived in the lighthouse uh, and I guess weren't lighthouse keepers. They were just regular Zandy Schieffer people. And during this time is when people began reporting spooky phenomena. And now Ooh. we get into the ghosts. Yeah, maybe I should take it back. I don't know if I want to live there, actually. <laughs> well, think of the Airbnb ability. Like, think of its potential, yeah. though, of, like, here's a haunted lighthouse that you just get to stay in now. Think of the views. Mm -hmm. I mean, capitalism, but also, like, think of, like, how much... If you were, like, a good old rotten dirty scoundrel willing to make people spend that kind of money how much could you make someone pay for a lighthouse apartment that's haunted with that kind of water view i may or may not have a list of airbnbs that are also lighthouses Shut for up! <laughs> future reference uh i would like you to report back uh, that sounds well, they are on so your cool. current coast so uh <gasps> the ones that i've seen are mostly on the uh like california coast um so and, I've yeah. I've literally watched this a documentary about Airbnb and how horrible some people who use those places can be like like just trash the fucking yeah. place throw house parties and yet my very toxic brain my first thought was Zandy, you tell me when you're here and we're going to throw the biggest house party ever at that lighthouse. <laughs> so, <laughs> Trash the shit out of it. Trash oh. the shit. Complete disrespect. Uh, no, we wouldn't do that. But think of what, think if we were 16, oh. it'd be a good time. So fun. Um, so let's see. So now are the ghosts. So people lived there through the 80s, but in the 1970s, one of the people who lived there, uh, I don't know if they, if, hmm. I don't know if every person who lived there, I don't know if any of them got to actually be civilians or if maybe they were park rangers and it was like kind of a perk of you got to live oh. on the property because any person I mention in this that has personal experiences inside the lighthouse, uh, I'm assuming because they lived there, also had some sort of job at the park. I don't know. For all I know, there were civilians. I don't know if that's the right word. Non-park rangers. For all I know, they also live there. I don't mean to like have totally gotten your hopes up that that was an option for people and now take <laughs> it away. But it seems like it was mainly park rangers. Yeah. Which that would um, make sense though. I think it makes sense. Also, I went to school, I worked at a water in a water town um, at Yorktown Beach, and it was there was a whole strip of super historical homes that were all from like the sixteen hundreds. And the two like most famous of the historical buildings that you would always walk by. One of them, if you were the park ranger, you got to live there. And if you were the mayor of Yorktown, you got to live in the other house. So I'm oh. wondering if it's like a government park. Yeah. Maybe someone they, slithered in there and they just got to live there. I'm not, I don't know. That would be me. If I have enough money, I would <laughs> pay my way into that. I'd be like, I am the I mayor now. My <laughs> government. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, yeah. If I have enough money, I could probably do a lot of shitty political things. So, so yeah, yeah, I'll get, I'll get there. Sure. I'll get there. So uh, the main person that I'm going to talk about with all the ghosts is park manager Gerald Sword, which is such a badass name. And uh, when he first moved in in the 1970s, uh, the other room was uh, taken by the assistant park manager named Anna Carpenter, who I guess didn't live there for very long. She very quickly moved out. And we'll get to their encounters, but I just want to finish the timeline real quick, is that they were there for the 1970s. In the 1980s, the Secretary of State for Maryland, uh, Laura Berg, 
or she become she one day in the future she would be the Secretary of State for Maryland. She also lived in the lighthouse at one point with her mm. husband. And I don't know if she had any affiliation with the lighthouse, which is why I'm thinking anyone could have just lived there if there was a vacancy. Yeah. Um, oh. she also had a lot of experiences and I guess she reached out to the park manager, Gerald sword and was like, Hey, are you having creepy things going on? Cause I had creepy things go on. And together they reached out to the Maryland committee for psychical research. And they were like, this place creeps us out. Come on in. And they ended up sending out people to do the first paranormal investigation at point lookout lighthouse. And that was in, I think 1980. Uh, it was led by a very famous parapsychologist named Hans Holzer. And although he's very famous, I did not know about him until this story. Um, but he seems like he's written like, like over 50 books on the paranormal. He like hosted a TV show for a little bit. So he's the, uh, he's the cat's pajamas. I just didn't know about him. <laughs> and so now I'll tell you real quick what Gerald's and the assistant park manager Anna's stories were. So I'm going to try to rapid fire it because, okay. wow, just so many ghosts and so little time. So, I mean, it makes sense. Just like last week's episode, like it makes sense. All this history, like. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad that you appreciate the, the research that went into that. So, uh, and by the way, usually when I do a ghost story, I'm like, wow, like if I just get like four or five really good spooky stories out of it, then I'm going to call it a win. This thing, like every website I looked at had different stories. Like it was just like, I usually there's like a consistency to notes, but people had been getting their information from all over the place. So it was just like, ghost story, ghost story, ghost story, ghost story. It's crazy. So here are just some of the things that Gerald and Anna specifically uh, saw when they moved into the seventies. They heard walking in the attic with very heavy boot steps, boot footsteps, booted footsteps. <laughs> they heard furniture moving on its own when the other person wasn't around. They heard voices during storms. Uh, once Gerald saw the kitchen wall glowing for 10 minutes. It's like, Ooh. yo, it was the seventies. I like to wow. think maybe he was tripping, but yeah, like, tripping on I would, if I were Gerald, I'd be praying that I was <laughs> tripping and I forgot. Um, but apparently the whole wall was glowing. Uh, doors and windows open and close on, on their own. Lights uh, turn on and off by themselves. They would hear items just crashing throughout the entire building and like not knowing where it was coming from. They would go check and nothing had moved. They couldn't find anything that, or they found things on the floor and it didn't. They couldn't explain why it had moved at all. There were strange lights that would appear throughout the house. Uh, they would see shadow figures walking around. Gerald heard voices around the house as well as coughing. And there was a two week period where he heard a man in his kitchen snoring every night, which is me as a ghost. Uh, that sounds so annoying. I mean, like ghosts like can freak me out, do little things, break some stuff, but snoring, especially if it's consistent. Just, as come a on, let me podcaster, sleep. when I need the silence, can you imagine being like, look, I know we all hear the snoring. <laughs> There's literally nothing I can do. <laughs> oh. Also, very creepy, his dog would act super weird. And this was not oh. the first time. This this became like a recurring thing where pe people's pets would just freak the fuck out for no reason. His dog started in staring at invisible things that were moving back and forth. It would even lunge in the middle of the night and like snarl bark at something as if there was danger afoot. One night, Gerald woke up to actually find his dog locked out of his house, even though there, the locks in his house were still locked from the inside. Ghost so, had enough. The ghost was like, <laughs> <laughs> stop barking at me, you little shit. You're going outside. I just, like, Christine, if you're listening, just letting you know, like, at any moment that's going to happen to Gio. Like, <laughs> that dog loves to bark at nothing. But yeah, truly, they were just like, okay, you are really getting in the way of me being, like, spooky and invisible. You're really, mm -hmm. like, throwing off the vibe. Just lock the dog out. Another night during a storm, Gerald felt watched. And when he looked out the window, he saw a man wearing old fashioned clothing staring at him. Mm -mm. I'm glad Oof. you say mm -mm, because I also said, mm -mm, but what Gerald said was come on in. So he, <gasps> he just opened the door. I don't know if he, I'm guessing I'm trying to explain his uh, lack of sanity that I feel like maybe he thought like, Oh, someone is coming in from the water and they were like, looking for help. I don't know if, what was going on. 
He saw this man in old-fashioned clothing. He opened the door to see what he wanted, and the man floated into the room and vanished. No. Oh. And apparently, the description of this ghost looked exactly like pictures of Jay Heaney, who died in the hurricane Mm. crash in 1878. Mm. This one is super crazy, and I just kept the quote in because I didn't even want to try to mess with it. But basically... um, uh, Gerald, one night the power went out, so he lit three candles. There was one candelabra. He lit three candles. All the candles were the same height when he lit them. He left the room for only a couple seconds, heard a sound, and came back to check on the uh, candelabra. And when he came back, he saw that all of the candles were burning at three different rates. One of them burned only an inch down. One of them burned four inches down. And the third candle, quote, had only about an inch of the candle remaining. However, a section of the candle rested on the floor nearby, which was the sound that he had probably heard. Appa- I mean, apparently, those- uh, apparently, somehow the candle had been broken. The wick on the length of the candle lying on the floor had been lit, but was now extinguished. Inexplicably, the small piece of candle in the candelabra was still lit. So it had basically someone had gone over and snapped the candle, thrown it on the ground took the like burnt out the wick and then relit the smaller wick Mm -hmm. that was still left it's ghosts find very specific ways to be so creepy yeah this is so specific (laughs) this action and like it's a statement personality yeah (laughs) it's a statement behavior of like i want you to know exactly that like you're not crazy but everyone's gonna think you are if you ever tell (laughs) someone this (laughs) I feel like I I wonder in those moments, like if I were a ghost, what would be that one like classic M move as a ghost that was just so specific to me that it'd be like, oh, I know exactly who who did that from the end. (laughs) Do you have a thing you would definitely do? I don't know. It reminds me, though, of um, I think it's the show Community where they like move everything in the dean's office like just slightly (laughs) except for one thing so the dean would think that that was the thing that was moved even though everything (laughs) else was it was like something weird like that i don't remember exactly but um yeah just the idea of just like those very little like this one seems like a lot and very like oh wow something happened here but I kind of want to do very subtle things so that they're not even reporting me. They're like, no one, they don't even know. They just think that they're going crazy. Just good old fashioned gaslighting. Just like, uh, well, like you know what I'm good at. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. Oh no. oh, no. I no. I feel like I would probably be this candle guy where it's like, I'm going to do so something so like unnecessarily aggressive and yet like, for yeah. no reason, for for nothing except to just throw you off. <laughs> um, so if I were to fall over tomorrow and become a ghost, know that if something really out of sight happens for no reason, it was me. Um, so also, remember the Secretary of State from Maryland, Laura, eventually moves in. So Laura had some additionally equally creepy things happen to her where she... I think the first night she was there, woke up to hearing heavy footsteps in the hallway outside her room. She heard a voice just sing it on the staircase out and proud. And apparently the song was very happy. But after we just recorded the last episode where that very happy song your dad sang was about like making your eyes into Mm -hmm. jelly. I I don't know. Without knowing the lyrics, I don't want to confirm that it was in fact a happy song. She also heard men laughing in the living room. And there was this weird stench coming out of the guest room. She also had, she saw several apparitions in the basement and her friend saw a woman on the stairs. So I guess um, this, this woman that was on the stairs, I think was also the same woman's voice that was singing a happy song. And people think that it's, that it's Ann Davis, the original wife of the original lighthouse keeper who took over when her husband died. A lot of people think it's her just like keeping up with her usual tasks. Uh, And people have seen her in a blue skirt and a white blouse always at the top of the stairs. So I'm guessing because she heard singing at the top of the stairs, it was probably Anne. And when Laura's mom came to visit and stayed in one of the rooms at the lighthouse, she woke up to her voice being called out in the bedroom. No, thank you. 
there's literally just something about that. I hate the idea of being waking up to a voice next to me, like in my ear saying my yeah. name. It's yeah. like the fact that it's it's one thing to hear footsteps and maybe it's some residual haunting, but when it's your name, um, oh yeah, that's a it's good intelligent point. and it knows it's creepy as hell. It's very personal. It's like they're after you. Yeah, yeah. It's Ugh. like they want they don't they want your attention. It's not like you happen to walk past them when they're walking down the hall. It's like oh, they're waking you up from your sleep to let you know that they know who you are. Mm -hmm. No, thank mm -hmm. you. But at one point, even though it's super creepy, the spirits did save her at one point um, because she woke up out of nowhere, out of a random sleep, and saw these six lights racing all around the room. Um, and she realized that when she was looking for the lights, she ended up smelling something and realized her space heater had caused an electrical fire in the other room. Oh, dear. So she feels like she never felt anything truly menacing there. And after that experience, I think she saw them as helpful or just maybe kind of chaotically in her way, but never mean. They just were looking out for her. And anyway, so between Laura's experiences and Gerald's experiences, they reach out to the Paranormal Committee of Maryland, uh, her Committee of Psychical Research, and they, and they, the committee itself brings out Hans Holzer, that famous parapsychologist, mm -hmm. and he leads uh, an investigation uh, with a bunch of mediums and, uh, I guess, demonologists or at least enthusiasts in, in the group. And they, in that one investigation, not only caught 24 different EVPs, like 24 different recordings, I don't know how many actual EVPs it was. They caught 24 different voices, though. Wow. So I'm imagining wow. there was more than 24 EVPs, but they got 24 different voices they could recognize all talking to them during that experience. I mean, imagine like that was 1980 and it's the first paranormal investigation. Can you imagine the centuries of ghosts that want to talk to you? Seriously, yeah. I'm shocked it was only 24, actually. I'm like, yeah. man, that's, I, I, there's got to be hundreds that want to say something. And that so was they, like, w that was within the lighthouse, though? Yeah. Because, like, on yeah, the property. They, like, I they bet, specifically like, were investigating the lighthouse. Yeah, yeah. Because I bet, like, if you go to any other parts of the property, there'd probably be so many more, too. Like, just all around. Yeah. Wow. So, anyway, they uh, they got a lot of really direct sentences, including fire if they get too close to you, which they think might have been mm. one of the guards during the Civil War. Uh, they got a woman's voice saying, this is my home. They got another woman's voice saying, let us not take the let us not take objection to what they are doing, which is one, a really quality sentence to have caught in, on an EVP. And second of all, like so kind and understanding and open minded of a random ghost watching us investigate. Apparently, they also saw the apparition of Ann Davis, I think, on top of the stairs and spirits at this lighthouse have been seen in photographs, including one really notable picture, which was taken during this investigation. They did a seance in the lighthouse and the picture, let me um, send it to you actually. So this is a picture from that investigation in 1980. And uh, it's an investigator holding a candle in the room. Oh, wow. And to her left, there is a Confederate soldier leaning against the wall. <gasps> and oh dear. You can kind of, it's it's a blurry picture, but you can see that there's like the classic Confederate outfit. It's yep. like, ha it's like he's only in half the frame or only half his body is in the frame, but you can see someone leaning there. His legs are crossed. He's, his little, his hands are behind his back and he's just leaning against the wall and nobody was there when they took the picture and nobody saw him when they took the picture. That That's something where I'm like, because you see a lot of pictures like this and they say, oh yeah. Like, look at what I saw. And I'm like, I don't see anything. Like, what are yeah. you talking about? But this, I'm like, I see a person there. And like, without yeah. being told there's a person there, I'm like, that is clearly somebody. Oh, my God. Ugh. And uh, so Creepy. that's, I that really freaked me out because I feel the same way where I'm like, yeah, I'm sure there was a face, blah, blah, blah. No, that's really a reenactment soldier. It looks like someone reenacting uh, or someone that got paid to be there or a poster or something. So... Uh, there's also another famous picture, which I could not find a picture of, and it's of Ann Davis in her uh, blue skirt and white blouse at the top of the stairway. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there's, it's a really famous picture, and yet I couldn't find it online, so I, I'm not sure about that. 
And they also got two uh, particularly interesting EVPs in the basement. One was of a steam whistle, which makes no sense. And another was uh, of shutters, window shutters rattling. But the shutters were removed years ago. Mm. Also in the room that Laura often said had a weird smell to it. She said it smelled rotten or something like too sweet. So almost the smell of death, um, I would guess. During that investigation, a medium went in there and she said that she felt really ill and that something really bad had happened to someone in the room. And I guess when the investigators were discussing that people were once held against their will in the lighthouse when they were prisoners of war, after they addressed it, the odor went away. And I'm not sure if that means permanently, but that was the last uh, writings I could find of it. Interesting. So it it was almost as if like it just wanted acknowledgement Mm -hmm. and then passed on. As for other activity, which is the last section I've got for you, people have been grabbed, people have been shoved in different parts, usually the basement of the lighthouse. Items have flown off of shelves. They've seen apparitions of soldiers all over the ground. So whether that's in the lighthouse or near the lighthouse or just patrolling the land, it's pretty rampant, these soldier ghosts. There are shadow figures everywhere, uh, lights not only turn on off by themselves, but there's like floating racing lights that will show up in a random room. Uh, Laura once smelled really, really strong coffee for no reason at one point during a different investigation. uh, It was apparently documented that 55% of the EVPs were male voices while 45% were female. And they got the phrase, help me. I can protect you. And then 23 times they got the word. Hey, it's interesting. Huh? Uh, there's one guy who named Robbie. I don't know what Robbie's deal was, but he was going through a rough patch. And he said that at different times, the way that he cleansed his mind or just got away from it all was in the middle of the night, he would just drive to the lighthouse and park there and just kind of like look out to the water. And it sounds like something I would do. Okay. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, Robbie said at different times that when he was parked there, he would hear voices right outside of the car window talking to him. He would hear rattling tin cans and he would hear horses galloping. Whoa. People have seen uh, gray faceless figures walking towards them and then vanishing and shadows disappearing into walls. Most of the activity is allegedly from October through April or, again, during inclement weather when, like, a storm's going to show up. Mm. And one ranger living here allegedly had a sick kid who wasn't getting better, but there was always this creepy cold spot in the area. And I guess someone said, oh, that might be a spirit. And so they just kind of shouted into the room, like, hey, cold spot, like, can you leave so, you know, maybe my kid can get better? And as as soon as they said it, the cold spot went away and the kid got better, which is kind of creepy because... If that's true, it sounds like this thing was almost like trying to attach to the kid or yeah. was like sucking out its energy and like, or, you know, existing by taking something from this child. But it, it sounds weirdly polite. Like, oh, you asked me nicely to stop? <laughs> of course I will. It sounds like one of those, like, I don't know, in my mind, like a shitty middle schooler where it's like, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't do <laughs> yeah. it. And then like, once you say something, they'll leave you alone. Um. And then in 1977, another ranger lived there named Donnie, and he worked on the beach and saw a woman looking around at the ground. So he approached her, and all she said was she lived up a ways and asked if she asked the ranger if he knew where the gravestones were that used to be there. And he didn't want to bother her, so he turned around to leave, and when he looked back, she was gone, even though Ooh. it was like the middle of a vast beach, she couldn't have ran away that fast. So he later asked Gerald Sword if there were any gravestones in the area. And Gerald said, oh, yeah, but no one knows exactly where they are anymore. Back when the Taylor family lived here, there was a family graveyard. And one of the members of the family was named Elizabeth and her headstone was stolen. Mm. So people think that might have been Elizabeth looking for her own headstone. One of the most common spirits, which Ranger Donnie also mentions, is this gaunt man in heavy wool clothes. Apparently, he, or at least other spirits dressed like him, are regularly approaching people. He smells like mildew and gunpowder. He's very, uh, he looks, I don't know if sick is the right word, but really skinny. He, his clothes are really dirty. And he's often seen running across the road unaware of others. It's almost as if it's like some sort of residual on loop haunting. Um, And this is a quote from Major Donnie. 
On several occasions, I've witnessed a man running across the road. The sightings always took place during the day and on the same section of the road, and the man always crossed the road just after my truck had passed, causing me to view him in my rearview mirror. The man was always crossing in the same direction, and other rangers have experienced the same phenomena while passing in their vehicles. The site of the man's crossing is very near the original Confederate cemetery used to bury prisoners who died of smallpox. Had the man been making the same trek during the Civil War, he would have been running in a route that would have taken him directly to the smallpox hospital. Reportedly, Confederate prisoners would trick the Union guards into sending them to the hospital, and then they would attempt to escape through the same area of woods which I've seen the man. Oh, wow. So it's almost like just watching history happen. Of either he, he probably faked smallpox and then just fucking ran for it. Or he could have died from smallpox and was running towards the cemetery. Yeah. So um, super creepy. And then I wanted to say that like I mentioned earlier that these ghosts really freak dogs out. Um, like Gerald's dog got locked out of the house in the 1980s. There was an, another assistant park manager living there named Bruce, whose dog would freak the fuck out and literally would jump through glass windows to get out of the house, Jeez. like through closed glass windows. Aww. And they eventually had to replace the house's windows with plexiglass and even after that, Bruce found his dog one time had jumped through the second story window no. and found him. He was fine, okay. but they found him on the roof of like the first floor because he had jumped through the window um, and he was barking because now he was stuck on the porch. But like he was desperate to get out of that house. Jeez. And then in 1999, another ranger lived there named Kevin Hook, and he said that his house, at one point, the temperature read like 100 degrees, and then, quote, the dogs ran panic-stricken into the dining room and barked continuously into the oven-like room. All of a sudden, the room turned bitter cold, even though the thermometer still read 100 degrees. The room was stone cold in seconds. We could even see our breath when we exhaled. It remained cold for about 30 seconds and then returned to its sauna-like condition. So it's not just normal temperature drops. It's like 100 degrees, I can see my breath. 100 degrees, I can see my breath. Crazy. Creepy. And then I've got... Two quotes for you, and then I'm done. Uh, the one is from a website. They, it was just people writing in about their personal stories. And one is from 2013 from a person named Kristen, who says, quote, I personally experienced one of the Confederate soldiers at Point Lookout. He looks exactly like Abe Lincoln in a Confederate soldier suit and looks worried but on a mission. Uh, I thought it was so odd that he was in such heavy, outdated clothing because it was in the high 90s outside. I thought it was an actor for the park, and he paid us no mind, but about 10 minutes later, we were chased by a presence that we couldn't see. It was moving in the tall grass and trees behind us, and we could hear the footsteps down the trail. When we would run, it would run, and when we stopped, it would stop. Don't like that. Absolutely fucking lutely not. That sounds like some Jeepers Creepers stuff of like you're running through a cornfield and you can't see the person Ugh. chasing you. Yeah. And also the fact that it would stop when you would stop tells me that like it was playing a game with you that mm -hmm. you didn't consent to. The last quote I have is my favorite. And uh, it's from, I don't know if they were investigators or just visiting, but their names were Jim and Julie. And they said... As we climbed the south side stairs to the second floor, a young boy, maybe eight years old, followed us, bubbling over with stories about the house and its hauntings. I did notice that he was alone and not with a family group, and I recall him saying, this is the most hauntedest lighthouse in the whole country. He followed us and talked with us for a few minutes, then went back downstairs at some point. And when we went back downstairs, we mentioned to the volunteer that his son was delightful and he had been well trained. The volunteer said he had no son, nor did he have any children with him. We looked around the grounds, no children. When we got home, we played the video and there was no child in that video, nor was there any young voice audible. Wow. So I, okay, that is... Where a child should have been, twas not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's the ghost I want to meet, though. That's, that I, kid sounds... Yeah. But also the awareness as a ghost of like, this is the most haunted place you'll ever fucking find. Toodaloo! Like, <laughs> it's, it's like a sense of pride. Like, and I'm one of the people haunting it. Like, yeah. I know it. So uh, the just for people wondering if they can go to Point Lookout State Park and see the lighthouse themselves, the park does close daily at sunset. 
And uh, the Preservation Society sometimes does open it up for walkthroughs. And I guess if you pay a certain amount, you can also stay and do paranormal investigations in the lighthouse. Ooh. And Living History, which is like the reenactment company, uh, they still do reenactments in June at the lighthouse of the Civil War. And the, the acting troupe that does the Civil War reenactments there is called Lee's Miserables, <laughs> which... <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Not super tasteful, but I appreciate the creativity <laughs> of Lee's Miserable. So, Lee's um, Miserable. Oh, my God. Anyway, that is the story of Point Lookout Lighthouse. And that was long. I'm sorry, but Zandy, you, you no. deserve a good lighthouse story. I loved it. And um, I was curious. And what an organization that I, um, I love is the United States Lighthouse Society. Um, mm. Yeah. You know, and they have a passport system similar to what they do with uh, uh, national parks where if you bring this uh, lighthouse passport to a lighthouse they will stamp it for you um mm. so i have like stamps from all these lighthouses i went to and i was curious and sure enough point lookout is on there so it's one that um i can get a, a stamp at that's so when fun I visit, so i'm very you excited. mentioned i think you mentioned that to me after um after oh. our, our first recording together about this, the little booklet where you can get uh -huh. stamps. And that was when I got my teeth sunken. Sandy, I don't think you know what kind of psychological damage you did to me after our first episode, because <laughs> we, you and I talked in the best way because you and I, all it takes is one person to be passionate about something. And I'll pretty much get hyper fixated on my own about it. And we talked about lighthouses and you did it with such passion. And you talked about a little booklet where I could collect stamps. You know, uh -huh. I love collecting things, especially little novelty tchotchkes. And um, I, like, spent the next three hours just looking at lighthouses. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with me, but I was Good. like, Zandy would be so proud. I and am. so I, I still think of that little booklet. So this is one of the places that you can experience yeah. that. And here it is right here. <gasps> My little lighthouse, lighthouse passport. passport. And... Um, yeah, so what I do is not all the places I went had stamps, so I just wrote in the day that I went, um, but some of them wow. do. So these are just some examples of where I went. Do you then, have a favorite one, Zandy? Um, honestly, like... Like a favorite stamp? Like just artistically? Oh, you know what? Probably, I think one of my favorites is like just this is it's just so clean and like shows a classic as a lazaretto point, <gasps> uh, which honestly was not the most... Uh, scenic of lighthouses I, I will say it's just kind of out mm. there but that stamp i'm like damn like that's a good he's, looking stamp he's the um, rudolph of lighthouses but he makes up for it with this <laughs> little mark <laughs> exactly exactly small um, but mighty small I, but mighty yeah i you really have i've actually thought about getting a lighthouse booklet and i was like oh who do i think i am like i'm i know i'm not going to I'm not Zandy Schieffer. I'm not going to make it a thing where I go to every lighthouse. But now I'm thinking, like, what about that one time I'm near a lighthouse? Like, i got to see if there's a stamp. And So anyway, you have mm. not completely turned me, but I am, I'm swayed. I'm very interested in, in the lighthouses more than I was. Good to hear. I also have a, a spreadsheet of all the lighthouses I visited um, and... That helps me keep track of it. Same with my, I did that with my record collection recently, which is why I know how much it's worth technically. I have which a is, spreadsheet of all my Pokemon okay. cards. It yeah. makes sense. I think it's a good it thing does. to do. Um, but like that was one thing when um, I visited D. So my now girlfriend, uh, when I first visited, wasn't my girlfriend, but we went to Montauk at the end of Long Island. And then I went to visit her again when we were dating. And she was like, look at all these lighthouses on Long Island, and we like I feel like we barely scratched the surface. Like I saw like three. You were you were all probably mushy gushy in love, which <laughs> is a sign, by the way, D. If you're listening, like he didn't even notice lighthouses next to you. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> That's I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 good good point. I should yeah, have said yeah. that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's so many, and so I yeah I encourage everyone to just look around where you live. Like where I am now in Cincinnati, no lighthouses nearby, except there are along the northern coast along lake erie there are like i think five mm. or six maybe even seven lighthouses um one i think is like in um cedar point like in the amusement park or something uh so yeah so just look in your area like that you'd be surprised that even in in philadelphia i went to one that was uh, on the schuylkill is that how you say it i don't even know schuylkill river 
uh, in Philadelphia, know. like in the city, there's a lighthouse and it's... What? It was so random. Yeah, it's really cool. That's it, pretty fun. Yeah. That's pretty fun. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I encourage you all to uh, go look for your own lighthouses. And I have a story of one in Scotland now. Scotland, comma, not Maryland. Got it. Not, okay. yeah, not Maryland. <laughs> okay. This is in, okay, I'm, it's in like Kirk, Kirkudbright, K-I-R-K-C-U-D-B-R-I-G-H-T. I don't oh, know. Oh, that guy. Yeah. That okay. place. Um, yeah. But technically it's not in there. It's on its own island. Uh, this is the Little Ross Island Lighthouse. And there was a murder there that took place in 1960. Uh, so just a single murder, um, just, I say. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right, yeah. I don't know how to talk about murder. I don't do it too often, but... Um... Well, look, how many years into this? I Now, actually, by the time this comes out, we're coming up on our five-year anniversary. I, hey. We still don't know how to talk about murder. Yeah. It's like, it's such a, you know, you want to do yeah. it as respectfully as possible. But I know what you meant by just one, like, versus, yeah. like a slew you know i did like so, 27 last episode right 27 like, plus last episode so <laughs> it's like and yet you've got enough information about this <laughs> just one to make an episode out of it yeah. so it's probably horrible yeah exactly um so this so how i started though was because i wanted to get some a little background so i found uh, a newspaper article from 1836 uh this is from the times in london and uh there was a petition a petition uh, to create a lighthouse, because at the time, in 1836, there was no lighthouse. Mm. So it says, Mr. C. Ferguson said, uh, he rose to present petitions from the landholders and commissioners of supply of the stewartry. There's the words in these article, old articles. I'm like, I don't know what half of what I'm reading. Makes me um, feel so dumb. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. have you ever done the, no, I don't mean to interrupt you mid-quote, but have you... Um, <laughs> Have, have you ever taken the eighth grade test from like, there's a, what's it called? It was, there was a certain year where there was a like, um, super, I'm, a super hard eighth grade test is what I'm trying to be good. Uh, Most of them would be for me now, I'm sure. <laughs> no, there's a, oh, 1912. Okay. So if you look, look this up later or, uh, one, oh, one's from 1912. The other one's from 1895 in Kansas. So go Everyone, if you want to feel really, really gross about yourself, um, in 1895, the eighth grade test from Kansas, apparently it was like the standard test children took at the time. I'm telling you, I think I could answer one question, maybe, and still not even really be confident about the answer. But just saying, like, those yeah. people grew up to write those articles you're reading right now, which is why we don't know what's going on. <laughs> I found it now and it's like, how many parts of speech are there? Define <laughs> each. And I'm like, no, thank you. Um, there's, Present, there's past. Scared fear and sarcasm. <laughs> and I live only exclusively on those two. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Oh, So yeah, reading these artic old articles, I'm like, half the words uh, don't make sense to me. But uh, it does say, um, so basically they petitioned the merchants, ship owners, and mariners of the Kirkcudbright area complaining of the want of lighthouses on the Scotch side of the Solway Frith. Um, whatever that means. I mean, Whereby... hey, ask a kid from Kansas in 1895, <laughs> they'll tell you. <laughs> Whereby numerous shipwrecks and great loss of life were frequently occasioned on that coast. Uh, so a lot of people were saying, hey, look, we're losing people. Uh, we're losing supplies to shipwrecks. We would love to have a lighthouse. Other people were saying, eh, it's really not that, it's really, <laughs> it's really not that deep. And that's literally what it's <laughs> like they're saying. Like, it's not that, it's pretty shallow there. So some other people on the other side were like, no, this isn't oh, that big of a deal. Physically not that deep. I, I thought knew. you meant, they like, meant people... <laughs> I thought you meant people were like, it was like just good old Trumpers today of like, you're being too sensitive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but both exactly like that. So both are true um, of what it, it's based on what I've read. Um, but then people saying like, if they basically said, look, if there were a lighthouse, we would not have lost these lives. And they also said um, there had been 66 vessels altogether lost on that part of the coast during the last 30 years. And, um, the establishment of a lighthouse on the spot he had named might have averted those to a great extent, if not entirely. 
and the lighthouse would be scarcely one tenth of the amount uh, to, to the cost to create it would be one tenth of the amount of the cargoes that some of the ships lost. So okay. basically, they're like. It, it'll pay for itself if we can save some lives and save some cargo. Uh, sure. It looks like in here, um, it looks like 1,400 pounds is what the amount that they were saying, uh, which huh. today would be, uh, based on what I Googled, $172,000. <laughs> which is a lot, but I guess nice for the of sake of, of saving lives, you know, hey. And hey, more lighthouses for me to visit one day. I'm for it. Um Spoiler, I mean, I guess I spoiled it. The lighthouse was obviously built. Hey, well, you know, I I had a hunch from the second you said the story is about a lighthouse. So it had to show up at some point. And then there was, uh, in 1842, when it was built, there was a uh, another article I found in the Belfast newsletter um, in Northern Ireland. And it was like a, it said, Notice to Mariners, Little Ross Island Lighthouse. Now, the commissioners of Northern Lighthouses hereby give notice that a lighthouse has been erected upon the summit of the Little Ross Island in the stewardry of Kirkcudbright, the light of which will be exhibited on the night of the first day of January, 1843, and every night thereafter from sunset until sunrise. Hmm. And then they give uh, more technical details. Uh, it says, for example, uh, there'll be a bright flash of light once every five seconds of a time, which means oh. 12, and it says, or 12 flashes in a minute. It oh. talks about the lantern, uh, and then nautical sounding words in here that I don't understand, but it's, it says it's elevated 175 feet above the level of the sea. Um, you can see it in clear weather at a distance of six leagues and at lesser distances mm. according to the state of the atmosphere. Question, so, again, yes. for the children in Kansas. Probably what is not a, an, no answer. What is a league? <laughs> a league, it's like a... I, I know think, there's 20,000 of them under the sea, but that's I, all I, I don't know. know if it's different from like a nautical mile. I, uh, I, let's see, a league is three statute miles. Oh, God, um, okay, that does not help me. <laughs> What's a statute mile? It's like, okay, I've got a friend who's a pilot and he talks in knots now, even when he's driving his yeah. car. And I'm like, shut what? the hell up. Like, oh we know God. what you're doing here and I'm not a fan of it. Um, yeah. So in the English speaking word, it's most common. It is, okay, as three miles. Um, oh, okay. But it says, but the length of a mile could vary from place to place. <laughs> okay. It's just a mess. Okay. Um, so that was the stupidest question I could have asked. Okay. At sea, a league is three nautical miles. Interesting. I did not okay. know that. So, yeah, um, that is what a league is. So, you can hey, see it at three nautical miles. We both learned miles. something today. <laughs> Good. Or did we? Kind, kind, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but that's okay. Um, and they also mentioned that there are going to be tolls uh, put in place oh. um, in order to pay for this lighthouse. Um, so it. if you were going and they had a whole list of different ports and they said, if you're going from this port to this port or this port to this port or this port to this port or that port to that port, uh, you're going to uh -huh. have to pay. This way or that away. Yeah. Yeah. So it says the toll of one half penny per ton of the burden of every such vessel. This really is such a math problem. Right. I've you're, you're writing out. this down, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've checked out. Uh, but for foreign vessels, not so privileged, the toll of one penny per ton. Oh. So, uh, yeah, those foreigners got to got to up the up the price. Now tell me the equivalency of a a half penny to my first edition Pikachu. What is that? <laughs> Your you first edition Pikachu is worth uh, three point seven uh, half pennies in eighteen forty two. Yeah, that sure. Let's. I'm gonna put that on eBay and see what people think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if anyone like if any bites come through. Um. So the lighthouse was obviously constructed, but it was constructed by Alan Stevenson, uh, who was a Scottish civil engineer known for his work with lighthouses specifically. He had built yeah. 13 lighthouses in Scotland, um, and he was very, part of a very, very famous family known as the Stevenson family, who I looked at and I'm like, damn, they are all famous. It's usually for what? quote unquote boring things like engineering um oh okay and like they're very it seems like just very well educated very smart people here doing really big things for the country of scotland um they had like and there were but there was like also like an art critic and then 
most famously an author uh, who was uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, known for oh. writing Treasure Island. Um, wow. And then uh, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And he was Alan, the lighthouse constructor, Alan's nephew. Wow. Can you imagine having that blood run through your veins and the pressure of being brilliant when you're I like... I can, actually. As oh. one of those brilliant hey. people. And Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say, hey, what a compliment to Christine. Oh, I see what's happening here. Okay, <laughs> I was, I was, I was complimenting the both of us. Um, okay, that's fair enough. I'll do that. But no, yeah, like, right? You're like, oh shit, my my uncle is this famous civil engineer, and like these all, they were all like, the government were like knighting the. I don't know what they do in oh Scotland. I forget. But they all these people were like really, really, really famous. But, um, and, but like, imagine the well holidays respected. when everyone gets together and like <laughs> roasts each other on like you're not even knighted. Like who do you think? You, like Ugh, like you're not even that cool. Like yeah. I would love to be a fly on the wall, but not at all a family member, and just see how they all interact with each other. To be fair, based on accents and the words they use, I don't think I'd understand a single word of <laughs> their conversation. Okay, as the fly on the wall, I would fly out the window pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, got it. So the lighthouse itself and the property has a pretty ordinary history. There was nothing. Uh, there were no hospitals for uh, prisoners of war and everything. Sure. Um, but uh, there was typically a head lighthouse keeper, an underkeeper, and then their families. Like I was saying, they kind of like also m started marrying each other and were just kind of right. all one big happy family. Well, if you're in the middle of like a, if you're just, they are the only people that you see on land. I yeah. can see why you fall in love with each other. Yeah. And you got for right? options. <laughs> and uh, for food, they had a small dairy and they kept pigs to slaughter. Um, and the most people living there at one time was apparently 14 people, and that was in 1861. Whoa. Um, but total, since the, the time that this lighthouse was created, there had been six, 61 principal and assistant keepers in its history. Oh, um, so pretty, pretty solid history, lots of people, but nothing that I could read or find that was too like dramatic. And, um, Got it. so nothing that interesting, um, until that is 1960. So this was on August 18th, 1960. Uh, Thomas Robertson Collin, who was a banker, and his son David, who was an architecture student, sailed to the island for a picnic. And I'm going to mostly be talking about this, uh, talking about David, who, uh, who's the son, who was 19 at the time. Uh, he, um, he's the one who's, he, as far as I know, he's still alive. He still talks about this. And I read a lot of interviews with him. And I watched a video of him being interviewed, I believe, by the BBC. And yeah, so, and he wrote a book as well. Talk about that. Um, so most of this will be from like his perspective or a lot of the, these, a lot of my sources were from his words from the experience. Mm. So uh, he was a frequent visitor of this lighthouse. Uh, he would sail there often for lunch or whatever, just to, to go see it. Um, oh, it sounds like, it really does sound like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, yeah, a, just a I casual lunch break at the lighthouse. Exactly. And he... Because of that, though, he could tell something was off. He saw, um, I believe it was, it was like a rowboat sitting funny, like in a weird spot. And he, and it was really quiet that day. So it was a holiday, a local holiday. And the principal keeper was not there. And he had been on either vacation or taking a break. And so they had two relief keepers. Okay. But still, he went and they sailed up there. And they're like, huh, it is suspiciously quiet. So they were looking for the keepers at first and they didn't see them. They were, their names were Hugh Clark and Robert Dixon. And as a courtesy, they went up to the lighthouse, the two, the uh, David and his dad, and they knocked on the door to notify them like, hey, we're on the island. It's not a particularly big island. So they didn't want to be like, have them suspicious of what they were up to. So they knocked to try to sure. get their attention and say, hey, we're here, going to have some lunch and then we'll head out. Uh, there was no answer. So they went about their picnic. And during their picnic, they heard a phone ringing, and it just rang and rang and rang. It was never answered. So they're like, okay, strange. And they made a mental note that once they were done with uh, their picnic, they would go to the cottages uh, that were on the island to see if they could find the keepers. Oh, okay. I think they might be sleeping or something. So sure. after their picnic, they went to the principal keeper's cottage, and, uh, and David said he found it, quote, spick and span, neat, clean, tidy, beautiful, 
a budgie singing in its cage, no sign of anybody. So he said that Sorry, was... Sorry, what, what was the budgie thing? Oh, we Apparently were there was a budgie about. there, like a, an actual b- bird, like in a cage. Oh. Like... Oh, that. I thought this was like a phrase, like a fun little... Uh, me too lingo. at first, but I saw two different sources that mentioned this bird, so I figured like... Okay, I don't think wow. multiple people are saying using this phrase, or it's well, just it a like, Scottish spick phrase. And, spick and span, budgie <laughs> in a cage, and I was like, what's sounds like going? What well, you say, it sounds like something from Mary Poppins, you know? <laughs> right? Uh, well... <laughs> so maybe... Jim Chimmery. I really <laughs> thought that... Uh, Okay, well, so there okay. was just a, a bird in a cage. Okay. Careful, uh, there might be some emails coming in uh, with people correcting and saying that is in fact a phrase, but it seemed like there's a bird there. I don't know. You'll, you'll be long gone by then, Zandy. It's, yeah. I'll deal with it, don't worry. You're twirling my mustache like that I can't grow and be like, ha ha ha, like, got him. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it was very clean and tidy. So they went to the second cottage. Uh, the dad knocked on the cottage and immediately, and like, and then like went in when there was no answer and came out immediately and said, "Hey, we need to get help. Um, something's wrong." And he said that he saw Hugh Clark in there with a towel wrapped around his head, lying still. And he said, "Must be an ailment." Like he didn't know what it was. He just said, "This." It was. Huh. He's sixty-four years old. He saw them and he was like, "Huh." something's up let's go call for help so they alerted nearby fishermen who then contacted the police and it took three hours before the police could arrive and it wasn't until that the police arrived that it was clear that he was murdered so okay they just were kind of sitting around like oh gosh like you know something happened like some sort of accident happened but then the police came saw that he had been shot through the head uh, with a 22 caliber rifle. Whoa. Oh, um, so that's the towel on his head then. And it was covering up the wound. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, obviously there was only one real suspect and it was the other relief keeper. Right. Who was 20 who was missing. He was not no longer on the island. It was 25-year-old yeah. um Robert Dixon uh and a nationwide manhunt began searching for him and he was Whoa. eventually found in Yorkshire and brought back for a trial. Um, so at the time there was a lot of media surrounding the case and a lot of the newspapers apparently were fabricating all of these details and making it really, really, uh, a lot more dramatic than it was. Obviously it was a tragedy, but there were so many details that were falsely published about him being stabbed multiple times that it was like this brutal oh. slaying. So MrNewspapers.com, did you find any of these articles? I looked and I couldn't. And I think part of the reason why is because um, their database isn't too, uh, like when it comes to foreign newspapers, like you'll get like the Times in London, which I found and like certain, major, like Belfast, major cities, but not a lot of the smaller local ones internationally that you get gotcha because in the u.s you see so many smaller local um but they're still adding some so who knows maybe they will be uh one day but i i I very much wanted to find one but uh they so they captured him brought him back for trial he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity but he ended up being convicted of murder and sentenced to be hanged and the argument there are a couple arguments on both sides so on the one hand they were the judge was like hey look this guy had the mental capacity to steal money to go on the run with. So there was like some sort of motive there. Yeah. But then it was pointed out that the amount of money, and I couldn't find an exact number of how much money, but everyone said it was not enough money to even live a month with. So it was like, what oh, was wow. the point of all this? Yeah, and so it was just like he chump change and he just ran off with it. Yeah. And, uh, there were also a lot of people reporting that he was clearly like mentally unstable and there was like a, a, more issues, including David himself, who was there for the trial uh, mm. because he had to give witness testimony. So they actually ended up commuting his sentence and uh, he was sentenced to life in prison instead, partially because they were like, yeah, this amount of money was not worth stealing. So it made no sense. And there was real, no real motive that anyone could find. Like, there was no argument that they heard about. It was just some, just a tragedy. Okay. Um, so then David talked about the case later and said that the real tragedy of the whole thing, I mean, not beyond the actual murder, and what haunted him the most 
was the trial, not even the day of finding the body oh. and being there on the uh, island, uh, because he said uh, that he was horrified to watch the court sentence Dixon to death, because while there was no doubt in his in David's mind that Dixon was guilty, like no, everyone yeah. knew that, he said he was against the death penalty for one, and it was also clear to him that mental illness played a really big part in the murder, and mm. there was no reason to um, uh, sentence gotcha. him to death. So um, after the murder, they put out a warning to sailors uh, that the light- lighthouse would not be manned. And a year after the murder, they decided to just automate uh, everything. And uh, yeah, and I think it still works. It's still running. It's still automated. And it's owned by the commissioners for Northern Lighthouses, who still provide maintenance. But something kind of fun, I thought, was that the rest of the island, not including the lighthouse... But the rest of the island, including a six-bedroom B-listed cottage, which I had to Google, uh, B-listed means it's a building of regional or local importance. So the rest of the island, along with one of these cottages, went up for sale in 2017 uh, for okay. 325,000 pounds, which is about $440,000. So you could own this entire island without the lighthouse, or without owning the lighthouse, including a cottage, for $440,000. Sounds um, like something Zandy Schieffer would have dipped his toe in, I think. Uh, 1,000%. <laughs> right. 1,000%. And I would like to think I would be the kind of owner that David would want to see because he still visits it. He visited it for all these years later. He continues to go. It's one of his favorite places to be. Uh, and when asked about the sale, he said, quote, I'd like to see it find a caring owner who wouldn't alter much. Um, and he, again, he visits it often and he wrote a book about his experience, I think within the past like 10 years. Oh, wow. Titled Life and Death on Little Ross. And it's about the island. So it gives a lot of history and then um, talks about his experience. Yeah. Wow. And I would, I, and I read that it did end up being sold, but I didn't, re- I couldn't find to whom or for how much. But what I did read was there was a lot of interest and it ended up going for quite a bit more than their asking price. Where is Little Ross again? What is this? Oh, it's in it's, London. It's in it's in Scotland. Scotland it's in Scotland, like right. Kirk could write Scotland. Okay, um, I was gonna say because, oh no, I was originally thinking like, oh maybe it was like Robert Downey Jr. because he lives in one, but it was it's a windmill, not a lighthouse that he lives oh. in. Oh, <laughs> uh, he, uh, I don't know. By the way, if you are a fan of the Architectural Digest YouTube channel, go check out. Do you watch? Do you? Do I you have know, seen those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s windmill? House. I have not. I have not. It's kind of like I well, because I want to ask when you're done with this. I'd like to ask what your dream lighthouse living scenario yeah. would look like. Yeah, I, I'll um, ask after this though. Interesting. Um, no, that was my end of it. That was it oh. basically. So, hey, Zandy, if you lived in a lighthouse, <laughs> what would it? If if you could revamp it or do whatever you wanted to it, do you have like a like a preferred lighthouse style you would go with or? Could you, would you turn into like a party lighthouse? Like if it's not in <laughs> use anymore, could, would you change out like the, the torch for like a disco ball? You know, like how crazy would it get? I think, um, for me, I'm going to be one of those people who says, uh, that I would like to keep it as true to the original design as possible, but I would make it as comfortable as possible for myself like especially if it were like a house or if 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 the living quarters were within the lighthouse itself I would go all out and just make it my style do whatever the hell I want on the inside but on the outside it would be just a normal lighthouse so kind of like one of those cool things where you walk in and you're like holy shit this is in here <laughs> like what I get you yeah I feel like I would want to keep the integrity of the lighthouse but I would give myself permission to do whatever I wanted to at least one room and yeah. I, it would probably do be like It'd be like apartment rules where like you can't paint the walls or anything because you don't want to like <laughs> yeah. ruin the history. But yeah. if you can hang it with thumbtacks, wow, it's going to look crazy. <laughs> oh. Or I would at least take like um, for the exterior of a lighthouse. I'm thinking like one of the like classic long, tall towers. Mm-hmm. Christmas yeah. lights. Just they do that. On. They, they <gasps> do that in uh, there's some lighthouses in Maine, uh, which is my like. My holy grail is, I don't know what to call it, my place that I want to go to, my um, Shangri-La. That's what my dad would say in this case, so that's why it's (laughs) in my mind, Um, is the Maine for lighthouses. I've never been to Maine, and that's, so like a lot of people are like, you got to go to Maine. I'm like, I know, like that is the place to go. Uh, 
but it's it's for me it it doesn't feel very accessible because mm. uh, so I would love to do a drive up the coast, but then I'm like, if I'm all the way at the top, where do I fly out of to go home? Do I have to drive all the <laughs> way back down? Like I don't know. It just seems like this is a big freaking state, and I want to see all the lighthouses along the coast, and there are a lot, and I want to go to all the way to the tippy tip. I think it's West Quaddy Point, um, which is the easternmost point in the U.S. Oh, and fun fact, it has a gorgeous lighthouse and there's so many gorgeous lighthouses and some of them for christmas will put up christmas lights that's so sweet yeah. i would like to think they get crazy with it for holidays because you got it like you got to keep Ooh, it hollow, think about halloween keep it spicy right like yeah. at least make it look like i don't know what you would do oh no i don't know what i would do i could I, i'd come up with something really wild for no reason yeah i i, I think like uh I'm, okay, this might be a little much and a little too dramatic, but no like you know the, the the barber shop pole, how it's yes. like, bar, like bloodletting kind of thing. Yeah. What if you could like project onto a white like tower lighthouse, like the blood going down for Halloween or something like really spooky like that? I is that a little much? I don't yes. Know. No, not at all. Also, if if we're really if we're getting into projector art, mm -hmm. I feel like you could do like. Even look like spider webs and little spiders crawling Ooh, all over good. it. That's good. That's good. Or you can make it look like um like green clouds or something like kind of smoky, Ooh. and then you can have like a big like inflatable cauldron at the bottom, so you see it like all rising <gasps> to the top. Oh my god! Or, okay, I I, mean, I love these ideas. This is great. Look, you give me a <laughs> projector. I hear thumbs up to do whatever I want. I, I but even like Christmas, like think of like you can get like little snowflakes, you know, like yeah. falling on it. Oh my I mean, god. It can, Wow. I, yeah, every day, three, 365 different designs for a projector I'd find for yeah. a lighthouse. There was, there was a lighthouse that uh, D and I saw. So we saw two at the same time. Execution rocks from a distance because that's in the middle of the water. Um, these are both we could see off of Long Island. Uh, but the one is privately owned. And it's on the list of the, the United States Lighthouse Society on their list. And it's called Sands Point Lighthouse. And on their thing, they say the best way to see it, because it's not accessible any other way, is to go buy it on a boat. Um, hmm. But we drove there because we were in the area and we drove there. We parked and we were like, oh, this beach, it looks like, like a public beach. I still am convinced it was a public beach. And we were walking along the beach and we we're like, I wonder if we can see it from the beach. And we saw Execution Rocks and Lighthouse. And then we like look to our right and we're like, oh shit, this is like someone's property. Like, why? Well, <gasps> so I don't know if we were trespassing. I don't know what the laws are around New York beaches, but. It was not intentional. Um, we were just kind of walking, and then we look, and we're like, holy shit, there it is. Look at it. And we took a quick selfie and, like, ran, because we were like, we don't want anyone to think we're, like, up to no good. We just, I was just, like, really passionate, and I think I was wearing, like, my lighthouse t-shirt. So I was like, I'm just passionate about lighthouses. Like, please, like, if anyone, like, there was <laughs> private like, security, like, too, on the other end. Like, they had a private gate and everything. So I was a like little It's like a badge. Nervous, it's like, not, who else is wearing a lighthouse sweatshirt, my friend? Like, <laughs> yeah, come on. Exactly. Well, I've, I've been looking while you were talking for the the one I wanted to tell you about. I sent you pictures already, but when we had our show in Maine, my goal was to see mm -hmm. all, like, of the six. I think there's six lighthouses in the area or something. And I wanted to see all six. I think I got to four. It was... I'm not kidding. Less than zero degrees outside. It was so oh, no. fucking cold. It was, we were there like early February or something. And it, t I remember I went into like, it was either Maine or Vermont, but I guess they, in their like main square, they have basically like an REI. And so I went in there and dropped like a hundred, two hundred dollars on like mountain gear. Cause it was so <laughs> cold. And also cause oh, I planned man. on being outside the whole time. And, uh, there was, my favorite one was, uh, one of my favorite ones was Bug Light, which I sent you a picture of. It was the tiny little stout mm -hmm. one. And then my other favorite one was the Curtis Island Lighthouse because that was the one that it had, it was out in the middle of the water. And I didn't know. I don't know why I didn't know. I think I didn't want to know that it was probably not legal for you to be <laughs> out there. Because if you look up the Curtis yeah. Island Lighthouse, it's like, there's the shore and like where people park and stuff. And then there's like a huge like, track of just like rocks, no bar, no banister, nothing like you should not be out there, but it's just a long thing, a slippery rocks out into the middle of the ocean and then the lighthouse. And it's completely like water, a uh, water 360. And I was like, Oh, I want to go out there and get like a panorama shot. And I just hopped like I was an Avenger just from <laughs> big rock to big rock to big rock and hoped I didn't fall. 
And uh, once I got out there, I saw a sign that said, like, 24-7 surveillance. Do not oh, no. come here. But, like, the sign was so small, you'd only be able to read it if you were all yeah. the way out there anyway. So I feel like I well, wasn't the first person They probably thought that the, the, the scary, treacherous rocks would discourage <laughs> most people. So uh, Especially, like, during icy... I don't know yeah. what was wrong with me. Well, but I, I would just, do the same thing. I would have been right there with you. It was worth it. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I wouldn't do it again. So... <laughs> Anyway, Curtis Island and Bugley were my two favorites if you ever get cool. the chance. So. Oh, yeah, no, that's the dream is to just hit the main ones for sure. So I'll, I'm hoping to get to the Ohio ones too, ASAP. Um, yeah, oh, I just want to see them all. There's 700 in the U.S., so. Oh, my gosh. A, a, lot, to, a lot to work on, yeah. It, it, there's really nothing quite like just sitting out by water. And I intentionally brought, like, people know I love my London Fogs. I would get, like, a really, like, piping hot london fog and then get in the uber to the lighthouse and then by the time i got out to the lighthouse it was perfect temperature and just sit there and like hear the wind and look at the water there's oh. nothing more peaceful in the whole world so oh my I totally god get okay it. i need to i need to live closer to the lighthouses this is ridiculous <laughs> what am i doing in southern southwestern ohio any uh, anyway everybody anyway. <laughs> welcome welcome and goodbye from the lighthouse episode the lighthouse Ooh. extravaganza uh thank you so much sandy i i feel so bad that this is like us parting ways now officially yeah. digitally but thank for, you so for much now. for being here and i'm sure us funkles will reunite at some point Absolutely. and we just have to you know get christine booted out of here again no no we'll no be we back can once more we, we can do a lighthouse themed uh whole other sh the show or something we'll fi we'll figure something out we'll don't we won't step on her toes <laughs> not not yet, but maybe if there's more babies in the future, we can there have a, a, a sequel to the Lighthouse episode. <laughs> All right. Well, for the final time, Zandy, and that's why we drink. drink.